that's a good segue into our next video, <laughs> um, which is actually uh, something that I've wanted to uh, watch for a good time, a great deal of time now. Uh, it's the John Bedini video on uh, transmutation. We're not going to watch the whole thing, but I wanted to see what his thoughts were on the ideas of transmutation. <laughs> Sorry, that was funny. I can do that voice. My pretzels. <laughs> oh crap, we're gonna get sued. <laughs> Sorry, I had to. It's just oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and we get tagged for the Frodo bit, not the Gollum bit. <laughs> oh, you damn you got it down good, Joe. Oh, yeah, that's Sorry. a good wow. No. <laughs> wow. Like I said, I used to do some voices. Oh, <laughs> uh. Dude, Gerald, it's just funny because it, it, there's no filter. He does that when the Irish guy's on. He's making Irish voices too. <laughs> yeah, because I don't mean it. I don't mean it in in a in a nasty way, right? Like I said, I don't have one prejudiced bone in my body. So it was beaten out of me when I was young. <laughs> crack me up! You just crack me up every time. Awesome. That's the intention. It's all about laughter. Life's short, man. Oh. I used to do Kermit the Frog, but I don't know if I could do him anymore. I don't even remember how he Kermit sounded. Kermit the Frog anymore. here. Oh, yeah, that's it. Let's see. Hi, ho, Kermit the Frog here, coming to you from Sesame Street News. <laughs> Shit. It's been a little while. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I oh love doing God. voices. I was never very good at them, but you're good at them. Oh. <laughs> I had some practice. <laughs> oh, Gerald, do some voiceover work for our videos, man. Put yeah, that's what I was thinking. Frog riding our stuff. <laughs> now, this Whoa. is how you do zero point energy. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> We're going to have to call a wrestler. Okay? We'll call in my chosen <laughs> Randy Savage. You can't get, you can't get uh, copyrighted or nothing for, for I don't know. The voice. Voice I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> I hope not. Oh, I hope not. Or my butt's cooked. Oh. <laughs> And plus, you're able to use like clips as long as it's short, like a couple. Well, I think it's you're long just, as it's in use jest. Use the circuit. <laughs> like, as long as you're not claiming that you're that person and that you're doing it, like getting paid for it. I think in jest, it's not. Well, I mean, all you're doing is promoting your stuff, works. you know. What's that? It's just, you're just promoting, you know, by imitating a character or whatever. You're only promoting the character, you know. Honestly, that's how. Uh, that's how. What's his Unless name? Unless you're Troy doing with South Park, be really famous <laughs> as a voice actor. Troy Baker uploaded a bunch of his uh, stuff on on YouTube, and he got a, a gig. And now he's he's you know the voice of Batman and the Joker and all sorts of stuff. Oh, that's cool. Who's Troy <laughs> Baker again? He's like one of the most prominent video game voice actors um, of our so generation. <laughs> yeah, or this generation. Huh. He's he's done. Uh, uh, he was Nathan. Uh, I think it was Nathan Drake in um, Uncharted. He was uh, Batman in a couple of uh, uh, video games. He was also the Joker in a couple of uh, Arkham video games as well. But he replaced Mark Hamill when Mark Hamill retired. I know that name too, right? When I was yeah. younger, I only. Do you guys know who Cheech and Chong is? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Chong came to our city uh, with Speed oh, no, Sport World of Wheels. It's a, a thing where they really hot cars decked out with sound systems and stuff, and you get to go view them, right? And I walked up to the table because he was signing autographs, and I did Cheech's voice and almost spit his coffee out. <laughs> <laughs> it was hey, hilarious because I just walked up and I was like, "Hey man, how's it going? You know my cousin. You know my cousin, don't you?" And he's just like he turned around and spit his coffee out at the same time. Well, close, close. <laughs> it was funny. It was funny. That's great. Yeah, that's yeah. Funny. I have no filter. I apologize to everybody out there. Like I said, I do it in jest. Did you see hey, that okay. SNL? 
actor, uh, comedian. I don't remember which guy he is, but he just imitates all the presidents like flawlessly, dude. Oh yeah, you know the new the new SNL crew and stuff. Yeah, I'm not really good at presidents. I've never really tried, but you know, he does Trump. He does Bush. You know, better than Will Ferrell. <laughs> and nice. Will Ferrell was good too. Apparently but, Bush is easy to do, but I don't know. Like I said, I don't do presidents. They get a little ticked <laughs> off. You say the wrong thing. Danny, <laughs> how well he does the uh, imitation. Yeah, Kermit's not going to come after me with a, 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 <laughs> a cease and desist order. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. You might get a rainbow connection going on. You got to be careful. <laughs> that song you sing, right? Did you just yeah, use just my voice? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, voices are fun. That zero filter right there, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so let's play this video. <laughs> so this video is uh, John Bedini on transmutation. Again, we're not going to play the whole thing, but I wanted to see what, what his uh, thoughts on uh, the topic were. Okay, John, do um, you want to tell us what, uh, what we've got here and how this relates to, uh, you know, what we just uh, filmed about... Uh, what was going on in the oven and so forth? Do you oh yeah, this is uh, relates to the uh, Sajeka files, and um, so, and who was Sajeka? John Sajeka was uh, a scientist of a type, but probably more or less worked for the black ops, and uh, he would go around to each company and collect different bits and pieces of information. And uh, just collect the materials on it. And then after that, the company would be out of business after that. And uh, so what this actually relates to is uh, when we were building these crystals, um, we were shown a process. And of course, you had to have a very open mind because the, the normal electronics engineer would would not, he would just say bull to this. It, it just didn't exist. All right. So we have Bernie here, the crypto alchemist. Welcome, Bernie. Glad Good to have you here, it. man. What's up, and we got some live electrolysis going on, and we got mm -hmm. all of Sesame Street. Uh, oh, right and Bert and Ernie. And, and, Kermit. and Kermit. And Kermit. Right. Mm. What a oh, day. that's awesome! Okay. I love it. But so how are you doing, here. Ernie? All right, uh, just getting set up to do a little live demo of the electrolysis for you because you're covering it in the transmutations and whatnot. So, I guess I'll let yeah. uh, get back to playing Bendini and his explanation. Awesome. Yeah. So when you're ready for that, just let me know. And again, this is uh, I do have a couple of videos I wanted to go over, but it's nothing extensive. They're very short and um, it's pretty much an open floor today. So. Very nice. You couldn't make a transistor this way. You couldn't make a, a semiconductive material this way. You couldn't make a room temperature semiconductor this way. In reality, you could because we have a whole board full of them here. And I'll just show it. Up. I'll hold it up. And I'll point with my pen. This is actually a, a semiconductor right here. You see the two wires coming out of it. And you see the substrate, which is this big piece of brass here. Now, depending on what we were looking for and what we wanted to do, we would use a material like if we were going for something like a silicon transistor, we'd want an aluminum base uh, with this material. But we were going for a room temperature crystal to transfer power down uh, number 30 wires. So what we wanted the crystal to do was add the extra energy to the wire to make up the difference. And there would be this crystal at one end transmitting the signal and then this crystal at the other end receiving the signal. So the process was unknown at that time only to certain people. 
uh, because the year is 1984, 85, right in there. And uh, so what the process involves is a rock, just any garden variety rock that you can just go pick up off the street. Sort of like um, John Hen John Hutchinson's uh, shake and bake method, only this is way before John Hutchinson. So we'd get a rock and uh, we would take that rock and we would mix hydrochloric acid, a one, a one tenth mix. In other words, nine parts water, one part hydrochloric acid, and we'd mix that up and let it stand in distilled water. And then what we do is we drop the rock in the bottom. I, I don't know if you can see the rock that's in the bottom of this. And okay, so yeah, we can okay, so what happens then is that this works like your stomach. It's going to digest the rock. Now, physically, you see the rock is still there, but it's actually digested all the minerals and elements out of the rock. So, okay, John, how do you get it out of there? Well, you put this iron rod in there and you set up your jar, face the rod towards the north. That's what we were always told, face it towards the north. Yeah, polar north. Polar north. And um, what happens after it digests it all is you get a crystal. You get a seed material. Where, where does the crystal form? On it forms on the rod. And you get the, the, the one we're looking for is not this. We're looking for this bottom one. Why is that? Because that's the actual material that's in the What's the saying? If you feed it, it will grow. Oh, right. And I've actually created some very similar looking structures off of iron rods uh, and crystals and rock minerals. Uh, in my experiments, I'm going to have to further try to actually replicate what John's doing here. That's fascinating. I'd like to see more of that stuff. Yeah. Anything you could show us for sure. I will definitely get a couple demonstrations here uh, while this plays. Ready. Yeah, just think of me as like an empty uh, trash can and just dump all your all your experiments into. I'll take all that content. Now we have a seed material. Did Bernie pick up the uh, video from yesterday where we had uh, uh, the other guy was on uh, Faraday Friday and he was talking about uh, the different experiments he was doing? I miss that part. I'm gonna have to check it out after, or maybe talk about Sean. Oh no, no. Uh, how he's breaking down material with lasers instead of electrolysis. Oh, Thomas. Yeah. Right. Interesting. Uh, I'm gonna have to check that out. Yeah, it was it was supremely interesting, and I think crypto right up your alley, man. You'd love it. Yeah, for sure. But if you can't afford um, a laser, you can just do electrolysis. You know, lasers are not easy to. I mean, well, yeah, well, I've read a lot on the official um, experiments, like in academia, having these breakthrough transmutations with lasers now, but in the high energy fusion. And it's like, this is us doing it on the low energy, which right. is awesome. What about those little pen lasers? Right? Like, those I, I want to try lasers. sound first and then then move to laser after. Hmm, nice. But those little pen lasers, if you get that in your eye, it'll damage your cornea. That's what I heard. The little lasers that they sell. Do for. not reverse Superman. <laughs> 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 I 
<laughs> well, I thought we'd get Gerald busting in with another voice here. All right. All right. Hey, uh, you know, I'm thinking here for a second, that analogy of a trash can might not have been the best one. I apologize. No. <laughs> um, that came out differently than what I wanted it to, so I apologize. <laughs> Like, I'm thinking about it in my head. I'm like, wait a second. That could be construed as, oh, crap. <laughs> oh. But uh, anyways, um, the, the transmutation that Thomas was, uh, uh, or the um, transmutation is something that Thomas was specifically going to be needing for his device at some point, he said, um, and looking into different device uh, mechanisms of transmutating elements. And I was thinking, you know, he, he's probably going to have to look into Ken Shoulders charged clusters. So, mm -hmm. hmm. there's also Ken Swartz's Moxie Fusion, another good one. But Moxie Fusion. Fusion, I haven't heard of that. Let me write that down. Moxie Fusion. You said yeah. Ken who? Ken Schwartz. I've heard of. I know Ken Schwartz, but I don't remember what he was when he talked about that. I don't. It's on Rex it. Research. Recently uh, added, actually. Moxie Fusion, Ken Schwartz. Oh, it's something new he's doing now? Uh, well, he just got like official like recognition and patents for it and stuff. So I, I was watching him when he was it. talking about about that, but not, I don't think he was doing it yet. Something he was mentioning that he was heading in that, something like that. He mentioned the term Moxie Fusion. Yeah, metal, oxygen. Uh, oh, with oxygen, right. Okay. Yeah. Oh, forget what the other two. Oh, right. He's, he, he said that uh, you can remove the oxygen from two indifferent metals and bind them together by removing all the oxygen. They'll naturally bind. So you don't need to weld. Like they, uh, they do that. It's the Japanese or somebody. They, 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 they put aluminum rods into uh, or something like brass rods or something. Another metal, steel rods, stainless steel rods into aluminum uh, engine block by spinning it at high speed or something so that it removes all the oxygen at the two where the two metals meet and they instantly bind like a like a weld that is you know permanent yeah thomas was talking about that on live uh was that thomas that said that or yeah yeah, no, yeah. What's this? oh this is the maybe that was thomas i can't remember yeah that was thomas then okay Oh, so this is it right here, the um, Ken Schwartz device? Moxie Fusion. Yes, sir. Uh, right uh, right at... Uh, it sounds similar to uh, what Rex Thomas Research. was talking about with the, with the metal. Just happened to have it in the background. But yeah, so here's the device. The okay, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, this Moxie refu Fusion device. Um... Let's see. Summary of the invention. Provide method for producing nuclear transmission at low temperatures, varying pressions, scalable, portable, and throttable. Uh, negative. I read this over the other day. Nuclear fusion. Yes. Okay. It's a type of LENR, low energy nuclear reaction. Um, I'm trying to find the summary that I read the other day. And what's the oxygen relationship here? That's what I'm trying to find. Maybe it's in here. Process begins with metal oxide, embodiment deuterium oxide, heavy water. Okay, so you need deuterium for it. Um, yeah, anyway, coincidentally, these these elements, you know, oxygen and hydrogen, they all have different ratios of protons and electrons. So here's the figure of the oxidation, I guess. Oops. I was using deuterium, I said. Yeah. Deuterium? deuterium, and deuterium. A deuterium, however yeah. you pronounce That's it. Yeah, the heavy type water. Of hydrogen. The heavy hydrogen. Yeah. Mm. Anyways, uh, sorry, back to the Bandini transmutation. Oh. Back to Bandini. 
Okay. <clears throat> have a seed material. Now, we dry that seed material out. We scrape this off and we let it all dry out. And then, then what we end up as a seed material, like this here. Which is a powder that's from digested from this rock. So what what you've got in the bucket there? How many um, how many batches of this um, process or how, of probably five hundred batches? Wow! All right. So what period of time did it take you? To but do we would use like a five gallon bucket to get that, and a big iron rod. In other words, like an inch in diameter. So how long would it would would it have taken? It would take weeks and weeks and weeks, maybe three, four weeks, maybe two months, depending on how quickly the rock could be dissolved. So we get the material. Now uh, this is one form of a seed material, and when we're dealing with this rock here, which came out of a mine in Arizona somewhere, they never would tell us where. What do but you mean? They they well, so Jacob would never say where the mine was, but it was in Arizona somewhere. Okay, so this is the, the secret sauce. Is, is yeah, is, secret sauce. It's where so, it's where the uh, where the rock right. came from. So, yeah. um, it, remember this is this is left over from nineteen eighty four and eighty five. So it's been in this bag all this time and that's the material that comes out of this rock out of which rock out of this rock right here okay. that came from that mine now what we were doing was trying to seed the material to get a property in the material to come out of the material like for example here uh when we fired this at, at 2500 degrees in an oven and it all melted down on top um, then what we've done here is we're showing what was in there after we had an assay and you can see right here the little arrow pointing that says there's gold right there so there's gold mixed in with this crystal what i think he's talking about a kiln okay now again yeah. an example of the seed materials huh. in this bottle kind of hard to see okay all right which particular seed material is that okay this seed material in this bottle is what's doing these crystals yeah but where did that seed which batch did the seed material come from that came from this batch right here okay and, and this this batch came from which rock this came from uh iron pyrites Okay. Okay, and galenas and things like that. And so nothing special about this. Nothing one. special about it because we're just digesting. This wasn't the secret sauce. No, there's yeah. the, the the secret sauce. Is the uh, wrong when we from say secret from, from Arizona. Right. When we say secret sauce, we're saying that each one of these rocks contains oh, a secret it? sauce. Yeah. All right. And depending on what we're looking at. Mm. So what I found confusing here was sauce. originally how he's like, oh, the mine is the secret sauce, the type of rock. And then now he's saying, no, that's not the secret sauce. But uh, I guess it both is, but there's multiple secret sauces, essentially. And that, I uh, guess, is he trying to claim that this one was pyrite that and silicone that was then transmuted up in elements? Or I guess he hasn't really said that yet. Or fully stated. Right. I mean, if you were me and I found a way to replicate gold, I would pretend like uh, there was a secret sauce. Hmm. Well, that's what I. That was my question: is is he is actually no, explaining everything, or is he is trying to? Trust, believe me, it's not uh, something you want to tell people that you actually be did. Because, uh, like you said, if there's multiple secret components to this that get it to work, you know, and and he doesn't want everybody to know exactly every component, he could have backpedaled. Well, maybe absolutely. I don't know. Maybe yeah, right. Backpedaling. That's what I meant to say. Right. Yeah. So, do you mind maybe um, bringing it back like sixty seconds or something, and we'll re-listen? Look, he's using copper. No, wait. What was that metal called again? It looks like copper. Right there. It's not copper, but it looks like copper. 
Which rod? Iron for the metal rod. And then from, from, uh, the silica that aluminum and, wing that he burned. That he has the uh, three crystals I, on or whatever. I think he said pyrite or calcopyrite, maybe. No, no, there's an aluminum. Anyway, uh, 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 that's the ring. material that comes out of this rock. Out of which rock? Out of this rock right here okay. that came from that mine. Now, what we were doing was trying to seed the material to get a property in the material to come out of the material. Like, for example, here, uh, when we fired this at, at 2,500 degrees in an oven and it all melted down on top, um, then what we've done here is we're showing what was in there after we had an assay. And you can see right here the little arrow pointing that says there's gold right there. So there's gold mixed in with this crystal. There's more details further in. Okay, now again, an example of the seed materials in this bottle. Kind of hard to see. Okay. All right. Which particular seed material is that? Okay, this seed material in this bottle is what's doing these crystals. Yeah, but where did that seed, which batch did the seed material come from? That came from this batch right here. Okay. And, and this, this batch came from? Right. Iron pyrite right. and whatever else you missed. This came from uh, iron pyrites. Okay. Okay, and galenas and things like that. And so nothing special about this? Nothing right? special about it because we're just doing galena so as well. Interesting. And it, I don't, I, I, it, I'm not familiar with that. It's how is that relevant? Is there any easy way to explain that to a layman? Well, yeah, because that's the seed elements that you're crystallizing that are, you're supposedly going to be transmuting into the new elements, right? Mm, okay, so that's what the you, like you said, the seed element that you're using for transmutation. Okay. Well, it's mixture. Is that it's a mixture of elements? Is that something we see common in, in other alchemists who try to do yeah. transmutation? You mix well, elements. Uh, yes, because it's right a chemical nuclear equ equation. So it's like you're either combining like uh, a salt and a metal together or a couple of metals together or uh, oxygen and a metal or an oxygen and a salt or a, a hydrogen and a metal, etc. sort of thing into the new elements so you're either just going like up one on the uh elemental weight scale yeah, if you're doing a hydrogen where you're going up like adding like both the of the atomic masses together if you're combining like a salt and uh metal together sort of thing i think ph stands for per hydrogen so I think that's what it Perox is. Per, per hydrogen. So that means the level, the saturation of hydrogen is the pH reading. And the higher the number, the higher the saturation of hydrogen, the lower the number, the less hydrogen. Ooh, which would affect if it's deuterium heavy water potential. Right, exactly. That's yeah. why they probably use ammonia. Because it's got a high pH, a lot of hydrogen. If what we're saying is accurate, uh, oh God, we just I can't. I could be wrong. I'm not live, sure. but anyways, let's continue with Bedini. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, <laughs> let's continue with Bedini. <laughs> no, there's the, the, the secret sauce. Uh, when we say secret, when, right, when we say secret sauce, we're saying that each one of these rocks contains a secret sauce. Yeah. All right, and depending on what we're looking for here. Uh, and and what we want to accomplish, that's the secret sauce. Right, right. Okay, and it's the method of how you digest that secret sauce, like you see right here. That'll give you. Then that'll give you. This will give you, what uh, you want. whatever the material is in this rock that was laying ac across the railroad tracks out back, which we know is a volcanic rock. Well, many things can be in the volcanic rock. There could be in here. There could be gold. There could be of silver. Gold in the rock. There's there could be sulfur, high co sulfur content. It could be very electrical conductive under stimulation. It could make a a fantastic radio crystal. So what we're looking for is when this dries out, what we want to do is take this material and place it on a piece of oxygen-free copper. It's like where, you see here. Where, where do you get the oxygen-free copper from? You just buy it. Okay. You just buy it from a metal place. 
And what you do then is you fire up your kelm or your oven to 200 and uh, 2,500 degrees and you melt it down. Now, how you have it tested is by what floats to the top when it melts, which you would term as a slag. So what it says right here is this material contains ruby, but black. Right. Okay. So now, so now when we finalize the material and we get it to the perfect purity, after getting the correct process in growing the crisp the crystal notice this is a real black ruby you can see it's shiny wow so that's a real that's a real black ruby ruby pearl ruby rubies are usually red yeah they're lovely pearl like uh, yeah uh, yeah but remember we're growing this in an oven right. and we're taking we're taking the material when it's finally melted and we're dripping it on some and letting it cool off so we can see what it is right and we have that assay so basically this all was known this was a known process by a man called john sajaka who had quite a bit had quite a file on uh, seed material at the time. And if you, if you wanted to do something, suppose you wanted to become the world's best alchemist. Well, there were companies that knew how to do this, but they weren't in the general vicinity of the public. They were hidden away. So, so this process is actually being, this process is very proprietary. And that's what uh, what I mean by forbidden science. You know, it's it's obscured. It's it's not something that they're going to teach you in academia because they don't want this information out because it challenges the macroeconomic status quo. But, Did yeah, somebody that's, that's say forbidden? forbidden? Uh, yeah. <laughs> the, world, the world has been running on gold before they really understood it. Yeah. You know, yeah. now they can make diamonds in a lab. Why do you yeah, think it was, exactly. They why can't do you make think gold in a lab even if they knew how to because it would destroy the economics that have existed since the dawn of time with gold. How we what Yeah, you you're absolutely right. What value is gold if I can just print it in my basement, you know? Uh -huh. Well, they already okay, done that. They already did that you know, by making the money, right? The fiat. Uh, they kind of already did that. What was the value of gold back then? Oh, this absolutely. In China? So, so here's the thing. They fully admit and accept that we're able to transmutate other metal elements into gold. They just state that the amount of energy and cost right. of it is more than the price of gold. Thus, right. it's not worth it to do it. But in reality, uh, there's been several other uh, ways of doing it by several different well, it's all on Rex research, but uh, people get Stanley Meyered for that. And that's why I don't really speak about mine too much and why we're going to work on getting, you know, maybe copper to silver first or something like that, right? I think it goes older than that. Remember in the Bible, it talks about how Moses, uh, when he came down off the mountain, there was this big calf of gold that they made out of. And he broke it up into pieces and fed it to them. Well, he didn't feed them chunks of heavy metal. He turned it into monatomic gold and fed it to them. It makes you wonder oh. how, if there was a truth to them walking the desert for 40 years, what did they eat? It's sand. It's a desert. Well, they ate manna, which is what? Monatomic elements. So gold had its purpose long before we started trading it. And using it for monetary value it's just we lost the knowledge how to take that gold and turn it into something that we could absorb into our body at a high nutrient level gerald you just dropping bombs on us today there's Damn. a small amount of gold and everything though it's just small small amount you know 
tiny, tiny. Yeah, but not the amount that's needed for the bloodstream in order for you to become kind of like a human superconductivity person. I'm not going to go brain fox. Sorry. Most, most <laughs> no, 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 you're bang on, child. That's how it's, uh, I understand it. And it's it's gold in the seawater. And yeah, no, I've never heard that before, but that this is all new to me. This is, oh, wow. You're essentially wow. supercharging your, like, living cells and electro bio energy and chemistry <laughs> into uh more plasmatic field state well it's written that moses was the priest of of uh the pyramids right because he was taught all the priestly ways well what was that for if you look at the book of kings and how the in the book of kings they describe the kings living for tens of thousands of years it makes one wonder if they live that distance in time because of the myth get that was made, being made by priests such as Moses or what we call manna or ormus or monatomic elements. It's all the same thing. It's a high uh, evolutionary nutrient that allows the superhuman superhuman ability of absorption into the body in order to create super conductivity within the person itself there. well whilst well, explain it to add to that Gerald it's that uh, the absorption the osmosis of the ormus or monoatomic plasma state single atom uh, gold and metal elements through the blood it's that it's able to go from cell to cell through the blood through the skin easily into any cell to be functional in that state and since it's a single That's atom important. and not bound it can uh, be used back and forth with the switching between oxygen and hydrogen uh, as the cell uses it sort of thing uh, but another point of that is that when uh, you encounter just oxidized metals in this nano state, like a diatomic when it's blue and it's uh, already got an oxygen uh, chemically bound to the gold or other metal, it's able to uh, absorb through this your body's cells from the size of it uh, still, but it then accumulates because it's not able to be used from that monoatomic state, but instead uh, then compounds quickly into the heavy metal poisoning and the coloring of blue of uh, the people consuming it and poisoning themselves, as opposed to what you see in front of you of this white state uh, single atom uh, metals that are being formed that is that. There is so definitely you, a formula to it, that's for sure. You find a lot of gold with the quartz, you know, the quartz makes the gold. The quartz, it's inside. Well, it. so yeah, we should finish playing uh, Bandini there because he's using silicone, which in, uh, I believe, part of the reactions with or silica, which is quartz essentially, and that, uh, yeah, that could Carbon be, silica, yeah. right? I guess we got to add up those the atomic masses Diam of these. Diamond elements. is supposed to be the purest form of carbon. Quartz is a form of carbon. Right. But of carbon. course, today we're letting it out. Because why take this secret to your grave? When you can gain minerals. I mean, it works just like the body. You take in your food and the hydrochloric acid breaks down all the material that you're, you've consumed, and it takes the minerals, the vitamins, and all this stuff. Well, here they are. They're right here. Everything that was in that rock. So now, what we can do is take this powder and put a scoop of it on a piece of material like you see right here. And then we can see what grows from that in the oven. And we can decide whether or not this is a good electrical conductor for say a room temperature semiconductor. So what you're pointing at now is that that's 
after being fired in the oven. Yes, that's after being in it. And it says right here what's in it because this has been assayed. It says ruby, right? gold, and silver. And that's from... Green frame. Ben, you're muted. Oh, my bad. <laughs> Thanks, Nathan. <laughs> uh, no, no, just real quick. Uh, that reminds me. Um, uh, we have about 55 people watching right now. If you can, if you can uh, donate a dollar to Crypto Alchemist channel, it would really help out in uh, keeping his StreamYard subscription and all that. So uh, if you can donate to Crypto Alchemist right now, he's got the link in the description or uh, in the chat there. Appreciate it. Yes, it's currently trying. Uh, it looks like I might actually was talking to one of my bosses today. Might actually have enough work in the next two weeks to get enough to make it down. I really got it. I got my three drone batteries, new charger for my drone. So uh, goal is to be able to make it down to Medicine Hat uh, at the I get probably first or second week of September there. And uh, later today, tonight, this evening, I'm going to be doing a second stream covering several new faces uh, that I believe I've found at the Medicine Hat Badland Guardian uh, Giant Faces site. Uh, so, yeah, I got to try to fundraise for that and get enough work to do it. And hopefully it's going to come together. That's all good news. That's good to hear, Bernie. Um, yeah, because it wasn't uh, again. If it wasn't for you, we wouldn't have uh, our Monday podcast, or I wouldn't be probably doing these live streams. You know, you inspired a lot of us, and uh, you're the reason why uh, a lot of us are doing what we're doing right now. So, and we want to continue Free Energy Fridays. You know, and, and this every little bit helps. You know, even if you have a dollar that you can spare and we'll put it towards the subscription fee, and you know, it, it will be able to continue to do this stuff. Support the burn eye, the science guy. Yeah, the burn eye science guy. <laughs> the bird is the word. Appreciated, right? Uh, and vice versa, all of you guys continuing on here. Why I'm here today, right? Got me uh, rushed back to studio to be here and loving the topics and the research. And uh, quickly point out, uh, I'll try to move the camera to closer, better angle with the lighting, but why it's so foggy there. Uh, currently, we are making the monoatomic Ormus as well as a bunch of hydrogen uh, with very little voltage uh, and current going in, uh, just five volt cell phone charger. Uh, but I will also try to get on view uh, a similar crystallization of what and Dini uh, is showing and going over and explaining on the rods there. So I guess we should keep on going with it. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> this material here. See, it says ruby, gold, and silver. Okay. Is what coming out of this mix and who did the assay uh a local assayer flame assay test and that was in the valley it and was it was handled by a guy that was very secretive yeah and uh i can only give his first name and that'll be milton and that was in california yes it was yeah this was done in uh silmar california yeah and then now the other thing is when you find a material that works, not all these are going to produce gold or silver or copper or zinc or anything like that. Some of them are going to become an electrical conductive crystal that you want to use for something. So, so anyway, some of these are going to become uh, electrically conductive and you want to use them, say, for sound. Or you want to use them, say, for power. Well, these happen to work well with power transfer. This is why they're big. 
they happen to filter out the noise on an AC line. So this would be in series with your AC line and it would filter out the noise. And uh, people in audio would use that as a line conditioner. This this one over here would be used in a stereo Excuse sensor. Excuse me, ba backing up, did, did you used to um, use those yourselves or sell, yeah. sell them to people that would yeah. use them? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we made speaker conditioners. This was a speaker conditioner here. It was encapsulated. And it says right here where it was done and, and the zip code and everything. And this would go in a speaker and it would change the total sound of the speaker. It would make the speaker, say, sound more like there was a tube amp running it, or, but with the bottom end, the bass end, and the, and the uh, top end. So if you wanted to, say, do preamplifying controls, it you wouldn't need a power crystal like this. See? Similar for, like, power you would use something like this right here. And these specifically were designed and measured for preamplifiers. In other words, input cables. So we could change the sound of the input cables uh, with these crystals. Once we got the mix, once we got the seed material right where we wanted it, then we would just duplicate it over and over and over and over. Uh, this particular one here, is used as a stereo synthesizer. A mono signal goes in to the substrate and the right channel comes out and the left channel comes out. So it's all a one wire system basically with a common ground. So this here uh, is this crystal here is being used for uh, a big power amplifier, a 200 watt power amplifier for running the speakers so you would figure out ahead of time what you needed yes and then go right. through the process to produce what you actually so you, you pretty much had it dialed in then yes we did yeah and uh the only reason that we got into this was because it was not copyable you couldn't copy it yeah yeah, when you finished forming that crystal, what happens to the waste product? Well, see, it dissolves all the way down. Everything evaporates and it leaves the crystal. Oh, okay. So there is no waste. Yeah. Because see, it's growing. See how it's growing on there? Yeah. And if, if, if you really notice it, it's, it's soft. Mm -hmm. See it? It's almost like it's little fibers that are meltable. So it's not granular? No. Yeah. So. How long does it take to grow? It takes anywhere from three weeks to two months easily. Because depending on how much material you're putting in here. Right, right. It, it, you have time for the evaporation process. Because you're not going to touch it. You're going to leave it facing towards that position right until it's done yeah and then what you're going to do is you're going to dry this out you're going to take it outside hang it up and dry it out it's not going to fall off there see and when it's all dry you're going to scrape that powder off into a crucible and then you're just going to grind it fine like this Right. I like this. Yep. Okay. That's so, grinding. What are you grinding with? A cruci you, you grind it in a crucible. Pestle and mortar? Yeah, pestle, pestle and mortar. mortar. Oh, okay. You're gonna you're gonna fire it on a ceramic block in an oven on a, a substrate crystal. Okay. Anyway, if we were talking if we were talking about this crystal right here. This is a power crystal, okay? So this crystal was used in a speaker line. And that box looked like this with speaker terminals.
And see, that at one time there was a bypass switch up here, which you could take the crystal in and out depending, so you could AV. What do you mean take it in and out? Well, you could take the crystal out of the system and put it back in the system. Not physically, but just by the switch. Yeah, just by the switch. Call and, and where would the crystal be? The, the crystal... The crystal is sealed inside this block with the wires coming out in the ground terminal and then the inputs and the outputs. This this happens to be for a preamplifier. See, it says ionic line amplifier. That's one of these crystals right here. Well, that would be that crystal right there. Yes, these these all measure the same. Right. So these are test sample crystals of which we mounted to a board so we'd have Going a reference. Going to the Bedini yeah. ionic line amplifier. Yeah. And basically that's what the box is. These are kind of beat up but because they've been around forever. But the, the original box said the force. Oh, yeah. And that, that was a bit of a legal problem. Yes, there was. Uh, George Lucas made us take the off when he patented the or when he trademarked the name. See, we were already using it, but that didn't count. Oh, <laughs> so, so that was from Star Wars. Yeah. Wow. Okay. This is a little bit. They were already using that. And then a big uh, rich guy like Steven Spielberg comes in and says, nope, I'm George taking Lucas. me. Or, I'm sorry, yeah, George Lucas comes in. And you know, says, I replicated the Dini Zeldin battery. You said what? I replicated a few a few times the Badini's Alum battery. I bought like a few dry dry cell batteries, like nothing in there, dry, you know. Mm. Yeah, how they work out for you? Never used the uh the furic acid, I just never used it. And I made the the alum spice from I ordered a big bag of it online, uh, alum salt whatever the cooking spice from the grocery mm. store i didn't get it at the grocery store i ordered a big ass bag and i mixed a bunch of, i made a few batteries i got like i made a bank probably holds about i don't know 100 amps for it's like a, a six six volt batteries they're about the five amps each i did like uh okay like i think like seven or eight of them so 50 amps or something Hmm. you know of uh alum batteries and it they would hold nine and a half ten volts and uh yeah they're very reliable and uh and you don't have to worry about them going bad i just put them away i've i made them like a long time ago and they totally dried up and i just wanted to see if they still worked and i put water in them again and bam came right back wow that's no, crazy. no issues it worked like brand new again like <clears throat> not like a lead acid where it would like you don't see the voltage or you don't see that you don't see the current coming out of it but you, you know nothing like that you see the current coming out just like it's brand new the voltage is there like it's brand new like you don't see any decreases in anything well i'd like yeah. to see um a breakdown on your channel at some point you know how you build them. Oh, i made a video on it a long time oh ago. you did yeah yeah just, when you find it post it in the uh, private chat and we'll go over it um if we you know all we, uh, have all time all space that's all it was. I heated it up with hot water. Now, I'm going to take yeah, a... Yeah, find the I'm mic. Gonna... Here, link mic. Yeah, it's, uh, this okay. is a free-for-all today. Anybody wants to present something? I'm interested in seeing everything. Okay. Like I said, I'm just interested in everything. So, I also did um, the Next in to there. Ernie there, you can see a bunch of the hydrogen bubbling up off That's of one funny. of the coils right in the center. And then mm -hmm. every so often, you'll also see giant bubbles going up, uh, shooting up as well. I did see what, yep, I saw one there, it's just there, yep. Yeah, so explain the difference between the tiny micro bubbles and the giant bubbles. Um, since they're both coming off of the cathode, uh, I believe it's potentially two different uh, isotopes of hydrogen, uh, and then there's also always off of the anode side, uh, uh, bigger bubbles too that are the oxygen. So you have both the anode and the cathode in the water. Yes, sir. And then uh, um, are you using just traditional multimeter probes or what, what are you using? 
No, I just got it connected to uh, the ends of a little USB wire, five volt uh, cell phone charger. Oh. Oh yeah, I see the coil there. Yeah, so sorry, it's a little cloudy. It's hard to make out exactly what's going on inside. That's why I just wanted to clarify it a little bit because yeah, I'm the, very fascinated with this. The pure white cloud on like the left side there, that's from uh, just a zinc sheet that I have as the anode, and that it's making the white monoatomic zinc uh, that is that cloudy section clouding up the uh, left half of the jar of reaction. Oh, so the cathode is just the USB wire, and then the anode is just the the, the plate over no, there to the so side. The, the anode is the positive. The cathode is the negative. Uh, the coils are connected to the negative, doing the bubbling up of the hydrogens, and then the anode you get from the zinc sheet. You get the monoatomic as well as uh, the oxygen bubbles coming off of. But it's kind of above the. Uh, camera level there you can't really see the zinc anode as it uh, gets eaten corroded away quite quickly so what i mean is the zinc the zinc anode is not connected by anything but the water right the water acts as the no, no, it's connected well it's connected to the positive wire of the oh, so it is directly connected okay but so that was my that was my disconnect i wanted to know exactly how it was going only connected that. but they're connected reaction wise through the water right through the electrolyte of the anode right. cathode back to the metals okay so i'm starting to build a little bit of a picture of what you got going on here <laughs> yeah I'll, we'll get back to i guess uh finally finishing off bendini's transportation and then i'll give a little bit more of a i guess uh, move the camera around to show what's going on in there sure Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to actually play the video and take a quick five minute break if uh, anybody wants to just take over for the, you know, um, comments and all that. But before Star Wars, because we were looking, we were looking for something that was unique in the marketplace. And, and just by accident, out of growing all these different seed materials, this is where Tom Bearden talks about where was the mine? Well, the mine was right here. Yeah. This was the mine. Huh. Everybody Digested says, well, rock. Where's the mine? Where'd you get this stuff? Well, I wasn't going to tell him that I that I grew it. <laughs> you know, so so. <laughs> You know that i had to get some special kind of rock or something because i'm not trying to make anything uh mystical here i'm showing you straight up front this is how it was done well in actuality um animals um transmute materials right. all the time like L right. louis kevron was nominated for nobel prize um for depriving chickens of calcium and they they produced eggs anyway with of course you yeah. see when you heat something and you grow a seed material like this, what happens when you heat it and you fire it at that temperature is it transmutes it. Yeah. Anything can come out of here. Like and, it says here. And so you could never really tell what, what, uh, no, we had to have it assayed. And if you look very closely, I pointed here with a black arrow that this material here produced gold underneath. Yeah, that is not pink gold. That is regular, right. regular That's yellow. regular yellow gold. One electron off. What do you mean one electron off? Well, when they do the analysis, he said that it was gold, but they haven't seen a gold like that. Huh. Okay, when they brought back the assay, then when they actually broke this down and flame tested it, um, and they looked at it under a microscope and everything. They said they'd never seen a ruby, a black ruby with silver particles in it. And you can see if you look very closely, this has very little fine Boring. silver specks in it. Yeah, you really need a microscope. Yes. Yeah. Hold on. Just see and then it's red in color. It just looks okay. black. Yes. And a good way to see that 
is right here. See? See the gold color here? And then if you look at the side, you can see where it's transmuting the gold in veins here, as you said, Pat. It's little veins. It's little veins, and then this is ruby. This is actual red ruby. That just happens to be this material. Hmm. See, and then what you do is you take this. After you take this off and you all you scrape it completely off, then you can get at this gold, you know, and then when you go to scrape it with something, you can tell that it's gold because it's so soft that it just scratches very easy. When you know that this material is not scratching. So is any of that a pure a slab of pure gold or is it just little bits of No, no, it's just a layer of it. A layer of gold, okay. Yeah, it's just a layer of it that's combining with the material to form an electrical conductive. So that the, the question was, where's the mine? Because it was rich in the gold or it was rich in the silver or it was rich in zinc or it was rich in gold. Well, the mine was right here. <laughs> there's there's nothing to it. Yeah. It works exactly like your stomach. It's not a big mystery. Why it was a secret for so many years is beyond me. And that basically all came from the paperwork that John Sajaka had hidden away for many years. And uh, he taught us exactly how to do this. How did he find out about it? Well, I can't say because he would never answer that question. Yeah. Where he got it or how he found it or who it came from. or. Why do you think he had it? Well, because it's possible that if you seed the material just right, that you could produce gold or you could produce, yeah, you could produce silver, you could produce zinc, you could produce, and it would be a fraction of the cost. I mean, what does some distilled water cost in some hydrochloric acid and a steel rod? Yeah. You know, that's not how industry does this. But this goes to show you that they might have even known this during the 1900s or the 20s, 30s, but he wasn't going to tell. Well, Tom said that 40% of the gold that the Russians sell is made in the lab. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. Th this would be making it in the lab yeah. the hard way. Actually, the easy way. <laughs> but, yeah. but you would say, you might be thinking to yourself, this is very hard to do because you got to wait the time, but no wine before it's time. Yeah. Do you know anything about monatomic gold or white gold? Or no, no, never messed with it. Yeah, heard about it, but never messed. With it. You mean powdered gold? Yeah, white powdered gold. Yeah. That's well, I do know that when you're making colloidal silver, I that <laughs> even though you have silver electrodes in there, the colloidal silver is gold in color. Yeah. Uh, and. Um, when you're making colloidal uh, gold, uh, it's white. Right. So why would you want to make colloidal gold unless you were trying to do something with DNA? Sorry about that. Did you have something to say, Bernie? Uh, what time does uh, APAC Open Mic start, Jeremiah? And yeah, I'll send you a link right now if you want to join quick. And I was thinking it, that was today. And if... Uh, yeah, try to do a presentation there maybe a little bit uh, once I get everything out here. Anyways, let yeah, back if to, APEC is yeah. going on today, we might do a little coverage of it. Yes, I I didn't get an invite, obviously, because I'm, you know, um, not a part of their show. But uh, yeah, we can cover a little I bit if you guys want to. You can send all you the link if you want. It's uh, the open one, the Zoom Zoom one. Yeah, it's not oh, by Apex. You said uh, for Apex? Yeah, Apex not by anybody. invite. There's a, a link on their uh, website. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I see. It's open, open Zoom today. Yeah. Um. Yeah. 
yeah, we'll jump oh, yeah. on there if you guys want to want to do that. Oh, yeah, uh, well, let's continue uh, with Bendini explaining this transmutation. Yeah, and um, whenever uh, uh, you're ready for your presentation, let me know, and I'll put you up. Okay, sounds good. What do you mean? Maybe you want to extend your DNA or yeah. something. Yeah. You know, it's well, just something that I heard a while back. and Gold and silver right next to each other. Yes, on, they on, are. On the periodic table. Mm-hmm. So it's not far to transmute one from the other. John Sajeka was a big fan of Walter Russell. So if you look at Walter Russell's chart, sort of looks like this. And then all the elements are in here. Right, and this is very different from the periodic table that we're taught. Right. So, um, you see, in this cycle here, right, you might have Cu here, which is going to be copper. Right. Right? And you might have gold a g here right so what's the difference between the two is a harmonic shift right you see it's a frequency shift because silver may be right here right here zinc may be right here right and uh, lead may be right here. But if you look at Walter Russell's chart and you look at what it would take to move copper to gold is a frequency shift back down to this level. Yeah. So if you can do something to this copper right here, this substrate, if you can do something to it by seeding a material on top of it. Right. Right. And then you fire that in an oven. What happens is it's going to transmute at that level. Whatever the whatever is in here is going to transmit it, transmute it to the to this material. Right. And so when you take this layer out. and send that for assay, that's what was in the material. Okay. So see, right. maybe Walter Russell isn't so far off putting the chart together the way he did. Yeah. After all, he did say that there's the, the positive spin and the negative spin. Of what? He called one a male and one a female, if you read his book. Oh, right. You know, he called one plus and one minus. You mean the elements? He called those elements plus. Yeah, well, he talked about life, about these two frequency shifts. You know, I think he had a drawing, something like this. Yeah. So I had to check it out. <laughs> and... Uh, I had to try it for myself, and I was thoroughly convinced after being... So Bob Greenier talks about um, the yin and yang of uh, uh, ball lightning or plasmoids, and uh, how specifically the yin, I think, represents the male, and the yang the female, or vice versa. I can't remember exactly which, but one spiral... Yes, yeah, one spiral represents the male, one represents the female, and everybody has both in, in them because if we didn't, we wouldn't be conscious. So um, it's just something interesting that we're making all these connections, uh, specifically with the frequency of elements and how you can change them. And, and just based on shifting the frequency, that all plays into the plasma unification model. And it's it's all coming together, guys. It's all coming together. Oh, yeah, it is. And uh, up, I've, I'm going through uh, just 
quickly flipping through trying to find Walter Russell's ones that specifically have uh, the labeling of the male and female, uh, the red and the blue, the ultraviolet and uh, the infrared, but they're on opposite sides in the balance of uh, his scales and that each of these uh, different charts and diagrams uh, that I'm going through are uh, specific additional um, periodic tables of Walter Russell. There's not just this one uh, vortex spiral uh, geometry, one that he's so famous for right here. There's actually mm. over uh, 20 different wow. uh, diagrams of the periodic tables, including uh, several of these ones uh, that have been dubbed uh, by some, like uh, the doorway or the arch um, tables as well, because they resemble the, well, the double or octave arch entrances to so many cathedrals, castles, and ancient sites. But here, he actually plots it out with the elements. That looks like a music scale. Yeah, yeah. well, it's octaves. They're octave scales. Yeah, so it's applying the octave uh, harmonic scale ratio. to uh, the different periodic tables and elements. You can't you can't have this tech without sound. Sound is part. It's yeah. We're seeing how music part. and and uh, sound is intricate. You know, sound pushes energy. So if you use sound to push the energy that's sitting there, you're gonna that's get. That's why I kind of. Well, that's why I kind of visualize, you know, everything at the quantum level being kind of like an orchestra. You know, you have different frequencies yeah, going on, creating a symphony. Uh, that's why you need the piezo buzzer. You push it. Oh. It hey, makes the sound that pushes the energy. It's a vorkestra, yeah. like a vortex vorkestra. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Just thought I'd throw it out there. Hmm. Chimetics. Cymetics. Yeah, right. cymetics. But you know, cymatics is not that simple to understand. I mean, how, who can understand and harmonics? Why the shapes are forming like that? I mean, they're interconnected waveforms. Well, we know that the waveforms have those geometries and all that, and that's the you know. But um, they seem to translate into two dimensional as well, because they're three dimensional waveforms we're talking about here. And that doorway look the, just looks like a music scale. You look at the cymatic plate. It's it is right. It's the octave scale. But yeah, but it but it's more like a uh, an organ when it, you play the right? organ. Exactly, and some of the stained glass windows actually resemble the hydrogen um, cymatic ge geometry. It's wild, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like the organs and all of this. The, the, ancient, glass the alchemy of the, the cathedrals. Uh, uh, we got to actually read that ancient book, and uh, it will explain it, right? Like, there's so much to it; it's wild. The older the book, the more the code is. Well, there's written. your uh, your magnetic flow there. No, is that, is that what that is? Yeah, I agree, Gerald. Read the older ones. Yeah, the codes are written in symbology and. And there we the go. Female, words that are used. Is this Walter Russell years. images? Yes, sir. These are all Walter Russell periodic octave uh, geometric diagrams of, well, mm. periodic and field physics, I guess. Well. He drew all these things? Oh, yes, sir. Every single one. There's actually like several hundred different diagrams uh, that he's done. These are just the periodic and octave scale ones we're going through right now. <sighs> it's like those that try to debunk Walter Russell without actually even looking at a fraction of oh, his work. That one there. I need oh, a yeah. copy of all these, Bernie. If you get me a copy of all these, 
I, I have an what? understanding of these that I can share with you, but I need to look. Is on Wikipedia or something? Absolutely. Uh, I will create a Google Drive file f uh, for, for sure. all of it and send y'all uh, links to it. And then I'll do a breakdown and send it back to you. I appreciate there's it. Yeah, there's something that I've seen in all these charts that all coincide with something I was researching. So let me put it together for you and then uh, I'll do what I can to send it to you right away. But I got a few things on the go, but I, I wrote it down on my book here. So it's... it's uh, I feel uh, you, brother. Appreciate it. And when you get her done, we'll look forward to it. Right? Darn Oops. straight. But it's hey, like Brady, I got a question for you. Copper and zinc. Did you put them together in one of your experiments? Uh, yes, sir. That's what you're actually looking at right there. Uh, the coils are copper, and then the um, metal plate there is zinc. So copper, cathode, zinc, anode in that reaction. Hmm. Very cool. I like how Walter Russell put all the uh, elements on the periodic table on the sine wave. He said all of them are metals except for, uh, was it carbon? The salts? No, even the salts are metals. Chloride is a metal. Sodium is a metal. They're all metals except for carbon. Hydrogen. Totally. No. So, Hydrogen yeah. is a metal too. Oxygen. No, no, hydrogen was the one that wasn't, is what he said. Yeah, you know, it was carbon. It was carbon. I'll be wasn't back. Carbon? I'll be back. You're going to step out for a I thought bit. it was carbon. Sounds good. Yep. So, what is it, good. Bernie? Is it carbon or hydrogen? It's not. Uh, oh, let's see right here. Uh, yeah, I think it's hydrogen because it goes into these smaller uh, sub octaves with alphanon, betanon. And yeah. what I believe, right? There's helium, so hydrogen and everything. Whoa. No, Bedini was explaining that Walter Russell said that all of the. Oh, yeah. Sorry. All Get of back. them are metals except for one on the table that he created. Was it this one? Carbon has a zero field. Sorry. But no, that Sorry. was my intro video. It's okay. <laughs> Uh, you got the rest of the Bendini one? Uh, yeah, yeah, I can pull it up. Well, hold on, was carbon the one with the zero field? Is that is that where uh, he I was think it's carbon, yeah, yeah, they had the zero field to it, the rest of them had some sort of field. Let get out of the hi fi industry with this stuff, and 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 we did do it, we were able to successfully prove that that it was possible to build these room temperature semiconductor. Oh, real quick, before I forget, what time is APEC? Because I want to make uh, sure I go over a couple Eight of minutes, things like eight that. minutes, I eight. guess. We got eight minutes left. And sorry, no, just to okay. get back to answer your question there, uh, Nathan. So yeah, carbon right here, you can see it's at the zero point, yeah, the yeah, yeah. equal Perfect. on uh, the... I guess the which side? I'm telling you, I have an uncanny one, memory on one side of it, like and this. then the next side on the opposite side, you have silicone as the next zero. Oh, it's and a silicone, yeah. cobalt mm. as the next one, and no, the next cobalt is a metal, and rhodium on the next. But there's also the hydrogen right there uh, as the first one below carbon but each of those being at the zeros or the equal points on uh, the wave scale and the octave scale. That's interesting. Yeah, I think we'll we'll just continue with this on and I'll uh, I'll finish up, we'll do some APEC and then after APEC I'll finish up with whatever um, I had planned. It wasn't a Sound, lot. Sounds good, appreciate it. Yeah, oh, of course. So we'll, we'll just continue on with this. If you guys have anything to add or you wanna continue talking about anything before we go on to APEC, let me know and we'll just, just interject, I guess. And use little bitty wires to transfer power. Okay, without any signal loss whatsoever and no heating in the wire. And we were using 200 watt amplifiers, 300 watt amplifiers. 
And we also found out that it was possible to make a big substrate, say bigger than this disc here, about this size, that we could put the material in this stuff, which is like a plastic. And then we could take that stuff and put it between two copper plates like this, and we had a perfect capacitor, 3.9 microfarads. We're going back to this one here. Mm -hmm. What is this now? That's this material. That's, okay. See, that's this material. This has been sanded off so you can see. Oh, okay. You so you, you just made it bigger physically. We made it bigger so you could see it. Right. So, so we could see it. Right. And then we would look at that material, and this, this material becomes something like a dielectric. It is a dielectric then. And then if you put it between these two plates, you get a capacitor. So we were able to, to build in a capacitance with the material into the crystal by, by putting these components, which were never seen or heard of, in the box. Because they were band sawed open and they didn't know what they were looking at because <laughs> they, they didn't know any such technology. Yeah. These that, are, is that one being band open? No, this yeah. one was broken open to check these jacks. And notice it's tuned. It's tuned between the grounds with this little coil here. Can you see that? Right here. See, and then this, this ground connection was to the case like that. And that's the ground of the substrate underneath here. But in this block is this chip. And a capacitor made from this material. So therefore, since you don't know the technology, you can't even, you can't comprehend it. Right. Because you can cut it day and night and try to figure out what it is. But when it's not electrical, the same way you know electrical, you know, you're, you're scratching your head a long time. In fact, to this day, they don't know. Yeah. And probably never will and never know how to do it exactly. Even though, you're showing the right Even though I'm showing you. And just back, back you up. have to know what you're looking for. Yeah, yeah. And that's one part that I can't give you. <laughs> right. You know, but I can talk about it. Right, right. So, and I can tell you that it's based because Sajika was very persistent on what Walter Russell said on this chart of elements. Because many times he would say, John, and this is exactly how he'd say it, John, where's the copper? Well, it's right here. Okay, how many down is it? Three, two. He said, now go down there and find gold. And so I'd go down to the chart and I'd find gold, right? And he'd say, what do you need to do to get gold? Well, you have to transmute the copper. So it isn't lead, like they tell you. It's copper. And when you do, you do the same thing with silver. You would repeat that over and over and over and over. John, here's silver. So what do you need to do? To get zinc. And you'd go down here and you'd look. And it's just a frequency shift between between all these materials. And what it's been in Walter Russell's books forever. Yeah. Forever. <laughs> but see when it, what I want to point out here is 
This doesn't make anybody a magician. This, what this says right here is you, the person that's trying to do this, have a lack of understanding. And so therefore you can't comprehend it. You think it's BS, but this has been in front of the public forever. You yeah, well, see, so things that we don't understand, we burn it at the stake. It's gone forever. You don't ever want to hear about it again in your life. You got this big mental block about, oh, it can't be done. Oh, that doesn't work that way. My meter doesn't measure it. Well, I'll tell you what. Your whole body's a big meter. John, back to that uh, Walter Russell thing with the two spirals, one to mm -hmm. That doesn't have anything to do with the spin of the earth, does it? No. Okay. It had to do with what Walter Russell was shown when he was in that coma. Because remember, he was in that coma for a long time. And when he came out, when he came back, he knew exactly what vibrational rate all these elements and everything were. Because he was shown. Okay? And we may be talking about that we live just here. But all these other things are at different levels. And what I get from all this is what Walter Russell was talking about is all you have to do is change your vibrational rate and you move up to a whole new realm. Which is what some of the religions believe. Right, that's what some of the religions believe. But suppose that you change the vibrational rate of things that are physically on this earth. Hey, Ben, pause it real quick, will you? Well, then it's... Yes. That's exactly what Gerald was saying earlier. Mm -hmm. Remember we were talking about inside his coil, when you get in that little special area, and we were talking about vibration and frequency. But Zini just said it right there. As soon as you're here, then you hit a different frequency rate, you're here. You get what I'm saying? Right, you shift. Describing what Gerald was talking about. Yeah, that's 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 all uh, we're seeing these connections and it's it's awesome because uh I don't know, Gerald, were you actually um researching Bedini while doing your coil or is this um Bedini stuff new to you too? Um I think Gerald said he was stepping out for a little bit, but I'm uh oh, that's right. pretty sure from in past Gerald's uh, done a lot uh in, of work understanding Bendini stuff if my memory serves me correct. Uh, but I, sorry, I have to actually run out here to the store quickly before it closes uh, myself. And uh, we'll be back in like 30, 45, if you're still going. And if yeah, not, no. uh, see you at APAC, but I'll leave my experiment cam on. And then uh, if you're still going, when I get back, then I can do the uh, demonstration of uh, showing that crystallized um, electrode there, like Bendini. Was showing but great work yeah plenty i plan on streaming for at least another couple hours so uh at least another couple hours so yeah we should be we should be live perfect all right well see you in a little bit awesome right on all right um did you want me to play it again nathan well yeah i, I just wanted to point that out for people who were watching earlier that we were talking about the different uh, in, in frequency time and if you're inside the bubble outside the bubble and Bettini just hit on it right there. Yeah. And it's important, you know, when we're doing these long streams too, to reiterate some of the things that we've been talking about because new people come in all the time. But yeah, let's uh, play it. Possible. Maybe John Sajaka was right. Copper is gold. And silver is zinc. And platinum is antimony. Who knows? You know, it, it would take a lifetime of for a person to, to do all this. I did nothing mystical except study the science and understand the science. And now I'm telling you the science. 
That's how you do it. And it's up to you to do it. I can't do it for you. Well, those are my so sentiments exactly so when it comes to uh, replications of the rodent coil system that I built. I didn't do anything phenomenal. You know, I was just doing what other people did and I listened to them and it, it works. So, you know, just be open minded and, and take that into account. You know, like uh, this isn't nothing new under the sun. You know, people have been doing this for years.